So uh, we didn't get a chance to go over HSGs in class, so I thought I would go ahead and just give you this presentation. It's not very long. Um, okay, as from a medical terminology standpoint, um, hyster, hysterosalpingography. Uh, the hystero means the, the womb, the uterus. Uh, salpinx is another word for tube. So when in HSG, what we're looking for is the... Um, the uterine tubes and the uterus itself. This is a contrast study of the female reproductive system. Uh, this is all in chapter 19 of your Bontrager book. Okay, so let's move along. Okay, so for an HSG, our contrast media is going to be injected into the uterus and then we're going to be looking for spillage into the surrounding tissues. And if we see spillage, then actually that winds up being a good thing. We, that's what we want to see. And if we don't see any spillage, then that means that there's probably a blockage. So if we're looking at, um, here's a little, um, like a drawing of the uterus and surrounding anatomy. And you can see, okay, so we have, uh, right here's the vagina. And then at the top of that is uh, what's called the external oz or the mouth of the cervix and then that leads up into the uterus and then we have two we have left and right um, uterine tubes and these guys open up into the peritoneal cavity and they're surrounded by these fimbrae and then you'll see that close by on either side we have an ovary and the ovaries are suspended by these ovarian ligaments so they're attached they're not free to just drift around and typically the ovaries and the uterine tubes will travel together if there is any motion. And you want these uh, fimbrae, these finger-like projections, to be close to the ovary so that whenever eggs are produced, they can be captured and propelled into the uterine tube. The uterine tube is divided into three parts. There's the isthmus, the ampulla, which is the main part, and the infundibulum, which is the entrance. So. The, the idea is the egg is supposed to drift up into this tube and somewhere along the way it gets fertilized and so it arrives in the uterus in a fertilized condition and then embeds into the lining of the uterus and there the baby starts to grow. Okay, so if we're looking at a sagittal view here of the female reproductive organs, this is kind of how they're laid out. And anterior to posterior, we have the pubic symphysis and right behind the symphysis is the bladder Right behind the bladder, we have the uterus and the vagina. And then back behind that, we have the rectum. Now, why do we do HSGs? Well, the main reason is to diagnose infertility. Um, usually, these are young ladies that are trying to get pregnant, and they're not having any luck. And so they've come into, um, they've come into our department so that we can get the doctor to take a look and see if there's anything obviously wrong. Now, there's other reasons too. Abnormal bleeding, congenital anomalies. Um, sometimes people are born with a, uh, like a problem with their uterus that keeps them from being able to get pregnant. Sometimes people don't ever start a period, so we can investigate why that's going on. Some people have really difficult or painful periods, which is dysmenorrhea. Asherman's syndrome is where a lot of scar tissue builds up inside the uterus after having infections or whatever, and then adhesions form. So the walls of the uterus are actually kind of stuck together by fibrous tissue. And spontaneous abortion is another word for miscarriage. So if somebody's having repeated miscarriages, is there something wrong with their uterus um, that's causing that? You know, we might be able to fix something or at least nail down the problem so that the patient can go to surgery or something along those lines. Now some other reasons. There are some IUDs and these are older ones that don't have any radiopaque markers on them so you can't find them easily. So if, uh, if somebody has an IUD and the doctor's not able to fish it out of there then sometimes we might be able to locate it with an HSG. It'll show up as a filling defect that's um, shaped like an IUD. It's going to be kind of tube shaped. So if somebody's had a tubal ligation, then we can locate those tubes, find out where they are, and, you know, probably used like pre-surgery so that when the doctor goes in, he knows where everything's located in advance. And some people can have masses. 
They can have stenosis, um, the, like the uterine tubes can be stenotic so that they're closed off. And then we can uh, do an evaluation of a hysterotomy. This would be status post C-section typically. And this is where there's been an incision into the womb and it was repaired, but then maybe it's coming apart. That's what dehiscence is. That means that, um, you know, like we put a suture in place, but it's not holding. This is the bursting open of a surgical scar. So more indications. We can find polyps, tumors, fistulas. There could be an opening between the uterus um, and, you know, like intestines or something like that. Looking for congenital anomalies and pre and post operative for localizations. And this is kind of like how the doctor maps out in advance what he's going to be doing. Okay, now therapeutic. Uh, sometimes when a patient goes for an HSG, it actually winds up fixing their problem. If there's strictures, kinks, adhesions, then um, contrast being injected under pressure could actually fix things. Uh, you know, straighten out those tubes or dilate them so that now they become functional. Contraindications. Why don't we do this? Well, if somebody has pelvic inflammatory disease, which is typically secondary to uh, an STD, in other words, they've got um, inflammation and infection of the uterus or vagina. If there's vaginal or cervical infections, especially if there's a discharge, if there's active bleeding, then that will mess up our HSG, so that would be a contraindication. If somebody's pregnant, then we can't do it because that would cause them to, to probably abort the fetus. And immediately pre or post menstrual phase, it's not going to be conclusive. And if a patient has a myomatous uterus, which contains a large fibroid, then that there's not going to be any place for the contrast to go. And so this study probably wouldn't work. Complications. Well, there could be a pulmonary embolism. Uh, if we used oily contrast especially, we could initiate an infection. We could exacerbate somebody's um, inflammation of their tubes, or we could actually cause a tubal rupture because even though the doctor is injecting by hand, there's some pressure involved. And if the uterine tubes are weak, then they could certainly burst. You know, that wouldn't be good for the patient. Now the contrast media that we use, typically water-soluble iodinated contrast. Um, Hexabrix is something that was used for a long, long time and it was safe. It was, um, it's an ionic agent, but it's buffered so that it works really well with um, female anatomy. And it was kind of designed for this actually. It's possible to use oil-based, but almost everybody now is using things like uh, Omnipake, you know, something non-ionic iodinated contrast. Because you don't need much. All you need is just like a little 10 milliliter vial and you're probably going to have contrast left over. Um, normally the water soluble contrast is proce processed out within an hour. It's going to, um, you know, basically whenever the patient goes to the bathroom, then this contrast is just going to go back out, you know, some of it's going to be absorbed by the body and it's going to be in the urine stream but then a lot of it is just going to um, leak straight back out through the cervix. Now the oil contrast, if somebody needs 24-hour follow-up films then the oil contrast is going to be the way to go because it will still be around tomorrow whereas the water soluble is going to be gone. Now patient prep, typically the patient's going to have a bowel cleansing prep you know kind of like they do for a colonoscopy um, patients typically going to be NPO the day of the procedure. They're going to need a consent form. If the patient is apprehensive, then they might be pre-treated with Valium. And this um, study needs to be done at least three days status post the finish of the menstrual cycle. What equipment do we need? Well, fluoro room, definitely. We could use a C-arm, absolutely. Sterile tray, uh, this is a sterile procedure, so everything has to be set up um, with a sterile tray. The doctor needs sterile gloves. If you're setting this up in advance, you need to be sterile, so be sure nothing gets contaminated. Uh, gooseneck lamp, headlamp, stool for the doctor to sit on, and ideally a table with, um, you know, like leg holders, stirrups, for the patient's legs to go in. Kind of like this. This is the lithotomy position. 
Okay, HSG tray. Now this is old school. This is a bunch of stainless steel equipment. Um, modern HSG trays, everything's made out of plastic and is disposable. But if you had a, like a metal speculum or forceps, then those would have to go back and be sterilized. Okay, the procedure itself. We're going to obtain a history from the patient. Do they have any allergies? Are they in pain? Have they had any kind of surgery? Um, have they had a C-section before? When was this done? Have they had any pregnancies that were successful? Miscarriages? Have they ever had a deliberate abortion? When was their last menstrual period? And are they presently on birth control? Because if they're on the pill and they're not getting pregnant, well, I think we just found the problem. And then we'll ask them, when was your last child born? And why are you having this exam? Just to make sure everybody's on the same sheet of music. And of course, as always, we have to explain risk versus benefits. And sometimes the patient's pre-medicated with glucagon, which helps relax the smooth muscles and um, eliminate uh, muscular spasms. And of course, we want the patient to empty their bladder before we give them the glucagon, because glucagon, it relaxes the tissues in the bladder. And if they need to go to the bathroom, then they just will, you know, so then that might make a mess. Uh, scalp pelvis sometimes. 10 by 12 shot of just the, you know, the pelvic uh, bowl because that's where all the um, anatomy of interest is located. And you can tilt the, pay, the, tilt the table slightly, Trendelenburg, if the doctor wants you to. And here's what a scalp projection would look like. This is just a 10 by 12 bladder shot and it includes the whole um, pelvic bowl. Radiologist is going to come in, they're going to clean everything, put the speculum in, clean the cervix, and then they're going to place a cannula or balloon. Um, this is like a little tube with a balloon on it so that it, um, it forms a seal at the cervix so that our contrast doesn't flow back out on us. And then the doctor will slowly inject the contrast and he may want you to drive the fluoro tower while he or she does the injection. And the doctor may insert a catheter up into the tubes for individual study. That's a possibility. And um, antiseptic, um, aseptic technique must be maintained the whole time. We don't want any infections. All right, and here's a picture. This comes from France, but you get the idea. Um, the doctor's injected contrast into the uterus. It's nice and dark. And we see the uterine tubes, and we see spillage bilaterally into the peritoneal cavity. Perfect. That's what this is supposed to look like. Now, after the procedure, uh, doctor's probably just going to use his spot images for diagnosis because the spots we have now are so good. If you have a fluoro tower that doesn't do good spot images, then the doctor may want some follow-up shots. Um, but, you know, this is all stuff that you know how to do. And 10 by 12 is plenty because we don't, we don't need to see the whole pelvis. We just need to see the central portion where all the organs are located. So, criteria. Pelvic ring is centered. Um, we can see the cannula, um, uterine, um, uterine cavity is filled with contrast and clearly outlined. And we can see contrast flowing out into the peritoneal cavity. We have good density and contrast. That looks good. Okay, aftercare. Patient may bleed a little bit, so we can provide them with a napkin, a sanitary napkin. There may be some cramping involved, um, but the radiologist will tell them about this. Because anytime you're messing with a lady's cervix, then you could cause cramping. Absolutely. All right, some terminology. Arcurate uterus, bicornate uterus, and fusion defects. Now, the upper border of the uterus is supposed to be... Um, convex, but sometimes it is concave. Um, it's just an anomaly. It may or may not mean anything. A bicornate uterus is a deep concavity, and this can cause a lot of difficulties with um, like pregnancy uh, and make, make the lady have pregnant pregnancy complications. And a fusion defect is a single cervical canal with two separate uterine bodies. Excuse me. Okay, so right here is an example of a bicornate uterus. See how the this indentation here is really deep. So this the 
the top of the uterus is actually projecting down into the body of the uterus, that might make it hard for the patient to get pregnant. Now, this is something called hydrosalpinx. This is where the uterine tubes are blocked up on one end, or maybe on both ends, and the, the tubes are all the time producing like a, like a thin mucus. You know, everything that we have seems like is covered with mucus. So these tubes produce a liquid, and if it can't escape, then it just blows them up like balloons. And that's the idea behind hydrosalpinx. And here is a cyst in a 32-year-old woman. Um, this is an HSG showing that we have hydrosalpinx over here on the left side. And then down here in the vaginal wall, there's a cystic area that's fluid containing, and it communicates with the uterus. So whenever the doctor starts putting fluid into the uterus, then it's backflowing into this cystic area. This probably needs to be fixed with some surgery. Okay, now some questions. Which of the following are not part of the uterine tube? Well, we talked about this. Um, going out from the uterus, we have the isthmus, and then the main portion is the ampulla, and then at the end is the infundibulum. The fimbrae are the finger-like projections, so that's the one that doesn't belong. Those are not part of the uterine tube. Which of the following is not a therapeutic use of HSG? Um, well, we can straighten kinks, we can dilate tubes, we can stretch adhesions, but what if there's a cyst there that's causing the stenosis? Well, we probably can't do anything about that. We might be able to find where it's located, but then a surgeon's going to have to fix that. Which position is most often used for an HSG? Is it RAO, prone, supine, that should say, or lateral? Okay, well, C. Um, we're going to be doing AP projections of the patient in a supine position. And which of these would be a contraindication to HSG? Excessive gas, distended bladder, premedication with steroids, Okay, uh, what about active uterine bleeding? Yeah, that's the one that doesn't belong. Um, active uterine bleeding would be a contraindication because that's going to mess up our study. It would be inconclusive. Now, why do we ask the patient to empty their bladder prior to an HSG? Well, to avoid interrupting the process to void, to eliminate the possibility that the bladder would displace the uterus, to minimize the dilution of contrast or to avoid compression of the vagina. It's B, to eliminate the possibility that the bladder might displace the uterus or tubes. All right, so now you all have seen my presentation on HSGs. Um, like I said, this is in the 10th edition. It's chapter 19, uh, the old book. I can't, hang on a second. Let me see what I've got here. In the old Bontrager book, which is the green one, that this might be the one you guys have. Then, let's see. Yeah, it's still chapter 19. In the green book, you're going to find it on page 718. And in the white book, it's on page 724. So look on page 718 and read all that stuff. There's like three pages of HSG information. And if you know that stuff, then you're going to be good to go for our test next week. All right, super. As always, thank you for tuning in and have a great day.